Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Hilliard Guest, and you guys are listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, yes. Hilliard is in the house. We've actually been trying to do this for a while, but you're busy. Yeah, I'm busy. Ever since we went to four shows a week, god damn, I am super busy. Is that how busy. many you guys are doing? Four Break It Down shows a week, one popping the bubble a week, and then I'm producing a couple other shows. That I'm sounds wondering fancy, why you guys just zoom like way ahead of me on, on how many episodes <laughs> you guys had. We, well, once I push the button, we'll be putting up 326 today. Are you kidding me? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. Wow. Because you know, I moved down here, I've got access to people and right. everything. But also, I've just gotten more comfortable with Zoom and like lowering. The, we talked about the quality, lowering the quality bar a little bit to get access to more people who are in the world. Right. right. So that has also. What do, you mean, what do you mean by that? Lowering the quality bar? Because we can't be in the same room like this talking right. with the oh, same kind I see, of mics, I see. right? So, so you now, have to Skype and all that shit like that. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Right. We use Zoom for that, mm-hmm. not this Zoom, but the uh, conference I've Zoom. Done it. I've done yeah. it before. And so it, it opens up the access to guests that you mm-hmm. might not otherwise get. Right. But it does open you up to more variables, and quality is one of those yeah, things. Because so I was approached by a marketing guy who wants me to do um, like advertising. Like he wants me to advertise on a podcast that he's working with, that he advertises with, and he wants them to advertise on my show, so vice versa. Yeah. And which I think is a really good idea. I mean, they hit me up out the blue. They have decent numbers, you know yeah. what I mean? I was like, hmm. And they, they talk about films too, so I yeah. thought it would actually would be a really good match. But they asked me, hey, would you consider um, having them on your show? And I was like, yeah, when are they going to be in L.A.? Well, they're in like Philly or something. Yeah. And they were like, oh, well, we'll Skype them. I'm like, no, bitch, I don't do that. Mm, I don't do <laughs> It just that. doesn't, yeah. I don't like it personally, yeah. well, you know? I don't necessarily like it, mm-hmm. but I'm willing to suffer the consequences right, to get right. access to these guys. Right, understood. You know, everybody's doing the content game right now, so mm-hmm. I'm trying to open it up. And I definitely recognize that the show quality isn't always what I want it to be. Right. But my philosophy is sort of like, all right, that one's done, though. Here comes the next one. You know, sure, are sure, you ready? Sure. You know, it's yeah. just I guess I guess my thing is if. If your audience isn't complaining, if the numbers aren't going down, if they're growing, yeah. then that's... Numbers are going up. You know what I mean? I think that's that's a good thing. And it's not like I'm ignoring quality. It's just at some point, the show has to be what it is. It's right. got to get swaddled on the button out right. the door, you know? You're always busy. How many projects are you currently working on right now? Well, <laughs> because we're online, and I'm going to say, I'm only working on my show. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but I do have a non-exclusive, so my feature scripts uh-huh. are out there. I have a movie um, that is a, I did a rewrite on, it's almost a page one rewrite. Mm -hmm. It's a little post-Civil War, two women, you know, right after the the war happens, all this crazy shit goes on. Yeah. And they, their whole families are killed on this huge compound and they decide to learn how to fight back and they go back and kill all these outlaws. So that, that was actually really fun. You know, doing kind of like a Thelma and Louise, but yeah. back then, uh-huh. you know, and they got to sacrifice, you know, their lives, you know, like it's, it's crazy. And they got to learn how to fight and shoot and blow things up, you uh-huh. know, so it was a lot of fun. That's funny. Yeah. What, what's your favorite time frame in history to write about? Like, what are you just like, yes, I get to dig into this. I seem to be drawn to the past. I don't know what it is. There's something about the Civil War mm-hmm. um, that I'm learning more and more that I'm finding myself drawn to and. You know, people are people are definitely interested in me taking a look at those things. And what I found is I try to give it like a new spin. Mm -hmm. So even if even if it's slavery in in a way, um, like like, for example, what I did with my um, Black Wall Street movie um, that I wrote. Um, I still try to make it so that it's not your typical white savior film, you know, the, 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 the blacks and the Negroes, if you want to call it, whatever the coloreds, whatever they were called back then, I still make them when they are by themselves, they are having a good time. Life is good. If they could just only get out of their situation, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I try to make them normal, happy in love with their wives, you know, in love with the husband, you know, in love with their kids, 
I try to find ways to do that so that it's not all, oh, we just need to get out of here. Oh, we so sad. You know what I mean? I want to make it so that, you know, when, when people see the movies that I do, from that perspective, that's, that's my new perspective that I'm giving, oh. you know, older films or historic films is the twist on, yes, we were deprived, but there were times when we singing, we were singing for happiness. Sure. You know what I mean? There were times we were loving for happiness. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I want to make sure that I do that. And, and I don't want just your typical, you know, white savior film. And I've rewritten two or three of them that had the white savior and totally changed it so that the black people save themselves or they just lose. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's just an example. Yeah. You think <clears throat> when I think about that theatric image of, the black family living in a slave shack or whatever it is, or being broken apart as a mm -hmm. family and everything. I never ever pictured like the little boy who was just mm -hmm. cracking the entire family up, you know, and not like, and you know, there were, yeah, yeah. And I'm right. not talking like Eddie Murphy style. Yeah, like right, I'm right. talking like the kid who's just the normal 13 year old kid mm -hmm. who's saying he's on a roll right. and the entire family's laughing because those moments do happen. It's, right. They just had to be quiet when the man came in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and that's, that's that's what happens when sorry to interrupt you by the no, way but that's that's what happens when 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 people who don't put themselves inside of those characters like that right. or aren't part of that diaspora they don't quite understand so they only show mm -hmm. well, we have to respect yeah. you know how they were and they we can't show this you know because there's there's a lot of things where for example when i was doing the black wall street research there was one of the documentaries i was studying they were interviewing like, all these survivors, right? And one of them was this old, you know, white woman, of course. And she said something I've heard many, many times. You know, if you go back to Jim Crow, you interview almost any of the white people. They really believe this. Mm -hmm. They were like, well, you know, well, I don't think that the blacks are all that, you know, of course, they use N-word. Yeah. We're, we're all that uncomfortable. We'd hear them out in the corn in the cornfields, in the cotton fields, you know, singing. Yeah. It's like, yes, they were singing because they were singing to each other to, to tell them things. There were codes. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? They were telling you how to cross the river and get over to the north. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't, oh, we're so happy. They, were, they made it sound happy. So you thought it didn't. But there were codes in those songs that they were telling you, be there at midnight so you can, you know, you can, you can get there before the dogs come. So that you could, you right. know, it was all these different little, little, I don't want to call them tribal, but they, in essence, they were. Sure. You yeah. know, but there were little mysteries and, and, and gems um, hidden within the songs. That, that they didn't know. But to them, they were like, oh, well, they were so happy. <laughs> it's like, no, bitch, they were not. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Of course, right. And, and I got to be careful about how I say this. I don't want to say it wrong. But in life, there's misery. There always is. It has to be. And is it, is it misery 20% more if you're a Who knows, right? But how much of that story do you have to own where there are good times? Like, yes, they're all in the field. And yes, right. there's a white oppressor who owns them or hires somebody who looks over them. But there has to be time when those guys are all sharing in a laugh. Absolutely. Or they're all singing a song together. You know, they all sing a, a spiritual together. I don't know. I mean, I can't say that that probably never happened. You know, some of those songs were so powerful mm -hmm. that I couldn't imagine that the Wranglers who were out there sitting and sitting on the horse with their horse whips right. never got caught up in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's fascinating. Yeah. See, that's making me want to see that. Well, and because so that guy later on breaks that whip out, you know, they all sing whatever song, whatever you know, song, right. and, and then later on, you know, they have this moment because they are, in effect, a family. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here comes the discipline for whatever reason. Right, and it's just right. like this. Wow, you know, and it, there has to be a time like when the guy who runs the house, he's like, yeah, let those guys sing down there. It, it's their time. Right. It's just, you know, there, there as is, long as they turn in to work on time. Yeah, yeah there is there some might humanity have been some in those monsters, you right. know, and I think that's almost more terrifying is even someone like Donald Trump has his tender moments, you know, and it's like to well, just. Maybe. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> no, it's a, you know, these kids love them and all that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> but it's easy to put things in a binary thing where Nazis are all bad. Right. And, of course, the Nazi idea is bad, but there are still people. Right. You know, there are still people that don't want to have to go down this. Anyhow, it's, stories can be so fascinating. It's one of the things I love about 
It, but that's why it's all about perspective. Yeah. You know, like you said, it's like what perspective do you show? You know, and it's a matter of you could be rolling, starting on the worst Nazi ever, but you go to the right and his right hand man might be somebody who's in love with some beautiful, you know, Jewish woman who lives over in France. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's a secret. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's it's all about who you decide to go home with and what, you know, what what's your way in and what's your story. Right. You know, so that's. That's that's what's fascinating about writing stories and like you hear stories about like, oh, and, you know, you, you're in the middle of writing a story or two yourself. Yeah. And there's so many war stories. Yeah. But your perspective on it, because you were there yeah. and, you know, if you just go to the left a little bit, it's going to be completely different than what they did in Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. It's going to be different what they did in such and such. You know what I mean? And and that's your that's your superpower. Yeah. That that people don't realize that you have. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to understand. You've seen many spy movies. Sure. But they're not going to see it from your perspective of somebody who's like, our system doesn't work. Yeah. And here's why. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Who's totally. that guy? Yeah. You know what I mean? That guy is different because now he's, 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 um, he's your anti-hero. He's your, you know, he's against the system, but he's for the system because he works for the system. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's just trying to change it for the better, but he's getting knocked down all the time about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'm already pitching your own fucking project, <laughs> but you know, but that's well, I was gonna, using yeah. that as an example. I was gonna th- so one of the stories that I'm trying to lay out in my head and I'm getting some help doing it, mm-hmm. but you start by telling the story from, from the Arab dude's point of view. Okay. And you know, you can instantly empathize that that is just a fucked up world that he lives in, and mm-hmm. we're, we we have a big piece of that blame. Right. And then you take that, and I'm using my hands one one hands facing down, one hands facing up, and you take like the American side, mm-hmm. and you end up flipping the stories and crossing them so that like right. you've got a double antihero kind of switchover. And that, they kind of parallel in their own ways. Yeah, and all of a sudden you what? realize like, you know, the U.S. side does ends up. How do they get to the point where they make the same decision to do these? horrible things like right. put someone on a bus and have them blow themselves up right. like and then just show that i don't know just that swirl together the culture, where really, yeah exactly stuff, right, yeah. Right. and it's I, i'm not very good at explaining it but in my head it makes sense you know but but those perspectives but, matter right right and seeing what it means to be an iraqi person that has no future and have mm-hmm. someone coming out randomly from thousands of miles away and mm-hmm. eliminating people that you know even if that dude was a dick, even if, if Muhammad was a fucking asshole mm-hmm. and you hated him and he owed you money, right. you know, someone else comes and turns his light out, you know, at some point you're like, fuck all this. I have right. no control over anything. Right. And then they just turn the whole table over, right. you know. But what's funny is I had a vision as soon as you said that, like, like uh, I was, we were talking in the writer's room the other day and I was talking with one of the assistants about, you know, about things that you have in the room that that separates you or or what you're good or not good at or what you need to grow at and i was talking about how and he noticed that when i said it i said i see i see moments mm. you know i now yes i can you can tell me a story and i can pitch you the whole story easily but in a situation where we're dealing with a consistent serialized situation moments come to me mm-hmm. you know what i mean and I, and I keep seeing them and they're usually something that's like really really thought of but it's really like and it's usually character based it's mm-hmm. usually from the heart there's usually something in there that everybody can grab and he was like wow yeah i could see that and he started talking about these different moments that yeah. i've pitched and he was like man that and they usually make it to the board right and and where i'm going with that is like as soon as you started talking about starting on the muslim guy or whatever you call them forgive yeah. me i immediately started picturing the kids here's the interesting thing hmm. you're in the middle of a battle zone yeah and the kids are still out there playing soccer yeah you feel me yeah and that and, and that takes us back to what you and i were talking about with the slave movies or the post-civil war movies they still somebody was still the kids were still playing yeah they still were playing jokes on each other because they have that kid energy yeah you know what I mean? And they're burning and they're, 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 they're full of anxiety. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so if that makes any sense. No, it, it makes total sense. Actually, a real life memory was we we're getting ready to leave the camp. And so there's four Humvees are all up armored. And there's this whole like code lingo you do as you're, as you're walking out. Like mm-hmm. you ha- basically have to say, we all have our weapons. Everybody's got a round in the chamber. We've got these various countermeasures. And it's just a real fast code. Right. Kind of like singing in the field. And then uh, the whole thing stops because one of the key codes was was not announced. So mm. like you're saying, like, we're all wearing black. We all have shoes. We all have headbands. We all have our armor. Okay, let's go. And then someone's like, wait, 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 hold on. 
Right. I don't I don't have my my you know, and it's not about uniform, but it's right, right. the systems. And so I'm struck by here we are in this combat patrol. We're dead stop because mm-hmm. there's a piece of electronics that's not working right mm. and not protecting us. You guys are out in the field. Right. And we're just out the gate. So right, we're literally right, right. like picture a dirt road kind of raised up mm-hmm. and we're about to drive into the city. So it's four Humvees, you know, spaced mm-hmm. apart. And, uh, and it's like, you know, you know, we're amber jamming, we're this, we're this, you know, it's like, it's almost like ordering from a um, Waffle House when you order like uh, hash browns, you know, like right, roasted, right. toasted, covered, smothered, and, you know, whatever, <laughs> syrup. But uh, it's like that. That's what right. you're doing. You're, you're telling every, you know, the, the, the group, the order. And so we're full stop. We can't go forward because it's too dangerous because we're having war, right? Mm-hmm. I look out my window. My window, by the way, is like a foot by a foot, and it's like four inches thick. It's ballistic window, right? So there's mm-hmm. not much window there. It's almost like a submarine. I look out. Boy, that's claustrophobic. As well. Yeah. <laughs> and the door's 400 pounds. Right. So once it starts coming, mm-hmm. it's not stopping. Right. It's going to, you know. So and when you go to push it out, you really have to push. There's a mom and a daughter just walking right next to us, parallel mm-hmm. down that little path. So here we are, like, oh, shit. We got to get this fixed before we go any further because we're in harm's way. And if we don't tend to this, someone's potentially going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. And then five feet from the door are a mom and a, and a daughter just walking down the road. Mm. It's just easy as can be. Right. And so it's just that. And they're not afraid of you. No. Not right. af- and, and their world is totally different. Even in that bubble, when we're sharing the same immediate space, mm-hmm. it's a completely different thing. Now, we're not necessarily scared of an imminent attack, but we right. won't go any further. Right. To, to tempt that out. And they're just, that's just their world. So does that make you guys in a situation like that, do you stop and let whoever go back and get whatever? Does everybody go back until you guys are all ready? What do you do? In that case, <laughs> you've got enough weapons that you can kind of just be prickly and mm-hmm. no one's going to come and approach you. But what we don't want to drive up is if somebody's planned ambush. So no one's going to ambush us right there because right. it's just too close. Right. And so in that case, if I remember correctly, we just had to like reset something. And it takes mm-hmm. five, ten minutes to get right. everything reset. Right. And it's like, does it come back on? But if not, the whole patrol will turn around and go back in. Okay. And then there's there's devices that you plug in to make. Because right, right, right. there's countermeasures for... Uh, like, so you can't make a phone call anywhere near us because we don't want someone calling somebody up and having the bomb blow. Oh, really? Feel like the bombs can be phone yeah. activated. Oh, right. So it's all about all these different systems. Anyhow, it's just such a different immediate space. The other one like, I think about is just like, oh, I call it the, oh, I'm not the only one here moment, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, my girlfriend, she's walking down the street and all of a sudden like a bee flies into her hair. Mm-hmm. And so she's throwing her hair around like a supermodel and swinging <laughs> her arms. And I look at her and I'm like, you're not the only one here right now. And then, like, you realize, oh, yeah, that's right. Huh, interesting. <laughs> I look like a crazy person. So, you know, like when you're singing in the car, you're having a great right, time rocking right, right. out, and you look to your left, you're like, oh, shit, that's right. I'm and not you know, the only one here. I was just thinking about this today because, you know, I'm driving in my Torino and I'm blasting my reggae music and shit, yeah. right? And I, every stop sign or stoplight I get to, somebody high fives me, gives me a thumb. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yells, starts getting hutch, whatever the fuck, right? Yeah. And and that makes me feel like a superhero. Yeah. So whenever my car's in the shop, I feel miserable, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so so literally, one of my favorite things that I like, I love to see somebody sitting in the car singing. Yeah. I just love it. It yeah. lights me up. It's like it's like uh, 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 seeing somebody. Like for instance, I watch a lot of. Um, and people mock me all the time. My writer friends, why do you watch that shit? I love like American Idol and all that yeah, shit, yeah. and you know the voice. I love Happy Tears. Uh huh. And somebody when they succeed and they win or they won that night or they got standing ovation from the judges, I know that feeling. Yeah. So that just constantly, I'm driving for that happy that Happy yeah. Tears moment. There's yeah. nothing better than me. Yeah. Than to me, you know. So so I get the same feeling with Happy Tears as I do turning to the left and seeing somebody singing from the top of their lungs yeah. in their car to Depeche Mode or whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, yeah. I totally, I love it. And I love that you collect joy like that. I tell mm-hmm. you, probably heard me talk I love about it. this. Like anytime you can find joy and go, there it is. I've experienced it. When was the last time you right. had it? You can collect it because it's easy to collect pain and right. terror and everything else. But yeah, joy is, is such an important thing. And, uh, I, you know, here's my guilty pleasure on mm-hmm. TV. I watched that, um, I don't know if they're going to do it anymore, but that designing show, like when they make clothes and stuff. The one <laughs> oh, with Project, the, Project Runway? Yes, Project I Runway. I love Project Runway. I love that yes. show because, well, one, you've got these people, and they do a great job of telling the mm-hmm. story. Like the one girl from Puerto Rico, folks right. are in the hurricane, right. and she's like going to the final right. show. I think, 
like that's just wonderful, but also just the stress. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to do this in twelve and, hours <laughs> in a day. In a day, right? And a whole outfit, and then you're like, look at these outfits. Right. And some people get it right, some people don't mm-hmm. get it so right, but. Mm-hmm. I just love all of that, and I like it. I don't like it so much when they're catty. Granted, that's entertaining mm-hmm. and all, but I love it when they really come together, you mm-hmm. know, and they have those moments because that's really more. You, they're to grow. But see, that's why one of my favorite shows is is Master Chef Junior. Oh because yeah, because the kids yeah. they rally around each other. There's no yeah. bad mouth in each other or nothing. They're just like you know how kids are today. Yeah. If you would have shot this 20 years ago, they would have been dogging each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but today the kids are like you know hugging each other, yeah. and wishing each other luck, and speed up, you can do it. Yeah. You know, there's all that rallying behind each sure. other. But to me, that's needed today. Yeah. You know, we grew up and we always we always joke about we joke about it on our show is that we grew up, you know, uh, during the time when there was lead in the water and lead in the yeah. in the gas and all the other, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So they don't have that now. So, yeah. you know what I mean? There was something wrong with us back then. <laughs> we were all <laughs> poisoned by lead, yeah, exactly. for sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, that, that is, yeah, that's funny. Um, I also enjoy the project when my junior, when they do the junior kids. Mm-hmm. Cause, see, Same thing. And, They're pretty yeah. nice to each other, right? Yeah, Tim Gunn isn't like super hard on anybody, right. but he's even more tender with the kids, right. you know? And uh, I just love the heck out of Tim Gunn, too. How can you oh, not like that He's guy? amazing. He, he makes me laugh. All right, so let's change gears. What do you want to yeah. talk about? Well, let me ask you, where, what's, what's going on with your, with your writing? You know, what, what have you been learning? You know, we, maybe we can yeah. get into that a little bit. Well, so the God's honest truth is, is that since we upped the production number, right. my time to do other things has been, I, I'd had to cut things back. So I've not been writing as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have been working on an outline. And so my idea is, because I know I can do this. I can talk and record. So my idea is to record, you know, the bulk of a book put it into written word and mm-hmm. then so you're writing a book instead of the script Is i think i'm writing script? both simultaneously okay, that's but I, you know i so i work i work on i learned this from you a little bit actually mm-hmm. I, I work on whichever one i can get the work in on in that right. moment so instead of being blocked where can i put work in right. and so you know the outline's pretty much done but it's always you know i'm always tinkering with it and everything and right. trying to break it into small pieces and mm-hmm. i've recorded a bunch of it in an effort to learn what that's like so none of it's really any good mm-hmm, yet mm-hmm. but it, but i'm working on that but process. you got your ideas out yeah and to me that's that's the biggest the biggest thing that we've been talking about for years you know i've known you for years now yeah. and and you've been talking about doing this and so here you are now now you have an outline yeah you know what i mean so you're ahead yeah. of where you were a year ago totally you know what yeah. i mean so to me that's that's the first step in being a writer that i talk to young writers or anybody who's starting to be a writer or a yeah. baby writer whatever is there's nothing you can do but be in control of yourself and being in control of yourself all you it takes 10 minutes a day yeah you know and you know not could you write every day yeah. you know whether it be writing something about the podcast or whether it be one of your blogs that you do yeah all that 10 minutes can get you you'd be amazed how much shit you can get done in 10 minutes yeah so i always teach everybody you know i know you're busy but if you're just giving yourself 10 minutes you'd be surprised yeah. Because now you're dedicating yourself to that 10 minutes. Yeah. So nothing gets in the way, no phone calls, no nothing. Your whatever is off, you know? Yeah. And and then next thing you know, you're like, okay, I need 20. Mm-hmm. And you start adding to sure. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you can easily write <laughs> 500 words on a Facebook rant. Right. Well, right. Why am I giving that away? Why, right. why put it into that instead right. of something else? Actually, I just interviewed over on Sunset a guy named Stuart Rogers, and he lives this incredible life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he writes... But he's gotten to the point where, and you must be similar up with this. He's like, I, every morning I get up, I do this, 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 and then I write. Mm-hmm. And I knock out a 750-word article for the people I write for. Mm-hmm. And I do it in about 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, it's a he, muscle. Right. Yeah, right. totally. And right. he's in shape. And he's, mm-hmm. it's tacit. There are mm-hmm. no type. It's just bang, 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 bang. Right. And he's got the idea. And he just mm-hmm. delivers it. But those 10 minutes, those 20 minutes, mm-hmm. turn into a bigger, stronger muscle right. in that window for sure. Right. And he's also taught himself... See, that's the thing, like, like everybody's like, man, you know, because they hear me say, you know, you need to be working on your speed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and they misunderstand. What I'm trying to explain to them or trying to tell them to do is, yes, there are certain um, fields that you write in that you do have to have a certain amount of speed. Right. You know, in television, for example, um, on my show, there's sometimes, well, on any show, I'll just say that. So on any show, for the most part, 
especially as you get closer to pr- closer to production, you start to realize, oh shit, in episode three, we realized that this particular scene isn't going to work yeah. because we weren't able to build such a set. Or, you know, we only have the actor for three days instead of five, like we thought, right? Yeah. So you got to go back and revamp things. Well, what also happens is they go, okay, that means I need, we're going to move episode four to the episode three spot and move episode three to the four spot. Mm. You're writing episode four, so I need you to write episode four now. Yeah. I need it by Friday and today's Wednesday. They, but they expect you to be able to do shit like that. Sure. So, so that's the things that I'm trying to teach people. Yeah is to prep yourself for those things that come about, mm-hmm. you know, because they do happen. And there's nothing you can do better than to please your showrunners with with a great first draft of whatever it is, that, whether it's the outline, you know, the story area, which is like basically a page or two over mm-hmm. here is the whole story, or, you know, the actual script. You know, but if you could turn that shit in fast and give it to them and it's interesting and intriguing and compelling then you are helping them. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what your job is to do. So when I'm encouraging writers to uh, work on their speed in any field that they're in, that's partly why. It's just like you, you might get, somebody might say, hey, um, you know, we're working on this great story about, you know, U.S. spies, you know, but, you know, the article is going out tomorrow. It has, it happens. You know what I mean? And you can't be like, oh, I need a week. You got to be ready to do that shit now. You stop what you're doing because uh-huh. I'm about to ruin it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to go hump the hump on them. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And like you, when I talked about when <clears throat> I first came in, you were given an opportunity. Like, I've right. already got that written. Right. And I'm not just going to tweak what just I have because it. I'm always in the workshop. And right. I've got that right here. Right. Pull it out and the idea is already built out. And that, and that in the creative world, that's something that you're just always doing it. Like when I talk to people about podcasts, and I, mm-hmm. I love talking to them about it, but I, I break it down to just basic, basic things. Like mm-hmm. it's great to think that you're interesting, right? but that don't mean shit because yeah. no one gives a fuck what you have to say. Right. They will care that you can put a show out when you say it's going to go out mm-hmm. all the time over and all over again. That seems easy, but it, you know, you put a show out. Right. It's, it's hard. Right. And, some days, and I drop an episode pretty much every week. Yeah. The 365 days a year. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, and it's, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll block, block, yeah, uh, I was about to say block shoot them, but I'll block tape them, you yeah. know, back to back. I'll do two or three of them at a time. And, you know, even if they don't necessarily go, because we might have talked about some shit that happened two weeks ago, yeah. I'd still put it out that way because I know my time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I've learned from myself that when I go on break, you start to lose people. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have time to try to get them back again. So I just keep it on a regular yeah. rotation and just it just comes out every week you know yeah one of the questions i get a lot is how do you get these wonderful guests mm-hmm. like well first thing is i ask right. but i keep asking too right. like you don't get danny trejo to show up because you say hey danny do my show right now he'll tell you yes but he doesn't mean yes he right. means you know yeah sure yeah, I'm he's not a, a busy guy yeah he's a busy guy right. and so like in two and, and we haven't even got him yet but mm-hmm. they, everybody has said yes mm-hmm. he needs a project we need a time when you know like so We've gotten further down the trail, but I've asked right. 25 times. Did you go to his new donut store he has right there? Not the donut. It's around the, right the corner. Place. Oh, yeah. I'll it's right check at it out. Santa Monica and Highland. Nice. Yeah, you'll see. It's like Dandy Trails Donuts or some hey, shit whatever. like that. You know, I'm, I'm all about it. I love support that guy. <laughs> but that's the whole thing is like whatever it is, whatever thing you want to do, you want to become a writer, there are 50 tasks around becoming mm-hmm. a writer that you have to master. Right. And then when you master those, now you're a baby writer. Who maybe can be counted up for that, that event? You're like, right. I'm, I'm 50 years old. I don't know how you know I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then you got to master 50 more things around those right. things until, right. like, you're like, that stuff, that's just what I do. Right. And it's, I've learned that a lot, especially with the podcast world. Like, I just, the ability to say, this show will come out mm-hmm. and have everybody have no doubt about it. That's just a step. Then you have to and, get higher. And here's the cool thing mm. what, what I appreciate, it's not, damn it, Pete, how come you haven't written your script? Yeah. Right? It's, okay, last time we talked, you didn't even have the outline. Yeah. You feel me? So to me, you have progressed. Yes. So you need to be patting yourself on the back going, okay, Mm, that's a step. Yeah. Feel me? I didn't have that before. Yeah. Now I have this ammunition. I still need to tweak it and make it better and all that shit, but now it's on, it's on the page. I know what my story is. Mm -hmm. You know? I know where I'm going. Yeah. So I could take this outline and put it into a script, 
Right. I could take this outline and put it into my book and just expand on it, right? Yeah. Or whatever. So you at least have that. What you what you have to keep patting yourself on the back for and, and understanding is if you are still writing your articles and all that, you are still writing. Yeah. It's a side of a muscle that you have expertly practice to do because even sure. that you have to learn how to do that yeah you only have a thousand words or whatever it is to yeah. figure it out so how do you do that and condense a whole story and make it make sense yeah, you know within a th- that's not very much <laughs> you know i'm just using it as an example you know what i mean so remember that muscle alone is something you have to master yeah. but i guarantee you and here's what i want you to appreciate learning how to do that is going to help you to be able to do this you know, the other thing I've learned, too, is is just to back off on all of the things. Mm-hmm. Just to say, I don't have time for these things, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm not going to. I, I, I should play my guitar more. I love right. it. I enjoy right. it. It relaxes me. But there, I just, that is not something I can engage in right now because I need to get these shows out to right. create this other thing I'm going to create. You know, the things I want to do and the things that I will do. Like, I've, I've hit the limits of my bandwidth. Okay. And so within that. I have now. I can reorder those things inside yeah. my bandwidth. But Let me ask you this: Yeah, what's your schedule? Like, what time are you getting up in the morning? What's your what's your routine? Let's say I get up on average at six in the morning. Okay. I roll out of bed, and mm-hmm. then I get to work on catching up on whatever emails and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's usually the first thing I do, okay. and then uh, after that, you know, I have editing to do. It's quiet. Mm-hmm. And so I'll usually put in however much editing time. If the show's not done, I edit it all in that morning. You know, right. but since there's four shows or five shows a week, I'm always editing. There's there's one or two things that I hear that are missing already. All right, let me hear it. You're not doing nothing for yourself at all. I wouldn't say that. But in a sense of just hear me out. Yeah. In a sense of your health. Yeah. You know, where are you taking care of yourself? Where are you getting up and taking the dog for a walk just to get your brain? Yeah, that you happens. See, you no, but hear me out because yeah. you didn't mention that. Right, So right. I'm only telling you what I'm hearing. Yeah. But, but there's nothing for yourself to just go, Phew, Yeah. okay, now I feel good. You know what I mean? Like most people get up, they go for a walk, they go to the gym, they do, you know, something yeah. to get the adrenaline going to get your brain in that thing. They do yoga, whatever the hell right. it is, just to get your mind This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at JohnLG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. To get your brain in that thing. They do yoga, whatever the hell right. it is, just to get your mind clear of the bullshit. Yeah. And sometimes the bullshit is when you sleep. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> absolutely. You know, those things are built in. Right. I, I, I can always do better at those things, but you know my girl. So mm-hmm. she gets up a little later than me. So that okay. first hour or two is my time to get in whatever I want to get in. And then typically we'll go out and do a morning walk. Okay. Because if we go in the evening, we don't always do it. Right. So there is a lot of that time. The other thing is, is, is every 45 to 90 minutes, I make myself get up and just do something else. Okay. Otherwise, I'm not just in front of the computer the whole right. day just hammering right. that's, away. That's right. important. Yeah. So some of that stuff's built in. Again, I can always improve what's there, but that stuff's there. Um, I'm pretty productive, but I also don't shut down until... Well, you know, I stay up late like you right. do. I'm up. To I don't. I actually, I don't stay up late anymore. Oh, you don't? Anymore? Not since I've been on the show. I have. Oh yeah. I've been going to sleep. At, I get ready for bed at ten o'clock. Okay. I'm in yeah. the bed by ten thirty, ten forty-five. I try to stop working at ten. Yeah. If I'm still working at ten, it's because I've got something I didn't get done earlier, or right. I took two hours to do something else in right. the day. You know. Yeah, but just be aware that it's a lot of time sitting in front of the computer. Yeah. You know, and and how do you manage that so that you have time for yourself, have time for your girl, have time for your yeah. daughter, you know, all those things you have to figure out. You have to have date night. You have to have things for yourself. And when I say that, I always tell them people like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, money's funny. I was like, the park ain't going to cost no money. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, all that stuff, yeah. you know, you can, you can make a sandwich at the house and take her for a little picnic. You know, there's things you can do to still keep the romance in there yeah. to keep it, cute or whatever that let me give you an example 
I was talking with some of the um, writers assistants about this other because they're always, you know, on Tinder or whatever, looking for some cute girl or some guy, whatever. And <clears throat> there, and I was telling them about how Scott and I have been together for, you know, almost 17 years. And like, wow, how did you guys stay together so long? And I was like, because we communicate. We don't go to bed without each other. No. We don't, you know, there's like, so we, like if he's out of town, we always call at 11 o'clock. We call each other right before bed. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, we have a little thing that we do where we connect. You know, when I'm busy like this, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm off on Sunday. We're not taping, so we're doing something. It could be something as simple as us taking my car, going for a ride to Ventura, having lunch, and driving back. Sure. It could be simple. Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but you find the time to keep it fresh, and that keeps my mind not worrying about them so that when I'm gone all the time and I'm doing my shit, I don't feel guilty because I know on Sunday or whatever the time is that you work out, you've planned to be their special moment for them. Yeah. And you're not like this on your phone all the time. You know what I mean? You go, okay, I'm shutting off for a couple hours. Yeah. And they're going to kill me. Ain't gonna kill me. It's not. You think it is. Oh, I know. But, yeah. it is, but it's not. I get mad I mean? with that for sure. Right. We actually... You know, because of life, sometimes you can't always do it. But I always and she always tries to bring mm -hmm. opportunities for us to just go do something. Like right. it was last night, I think Gregory Porter was at the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. And he's just a wonderful, beautiful singer. You right. know, he's just a huge mountain of a man. He's boy football. Okay. But he sings jazz like Nat King Cole right. and just fantastic. So I'm like, we could go see this and it would be like 50 bucks right. at the Hollywood Bowl. Right. I mean, it's a big time investment, but, you know, that's part yeah, of it. Driving thing. all the way from where yeah. you guys live, too. But, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're all, and we were trying to go to Erasure. We still may go mm -hmm. next week because it's her birthday week mm -hmm. and everything. So, but we try to find those things. But you're right. It's easy to, all of a sudden, it's been two months since you've done anything. Right. You know? It happens really. You ain't been with her in two years yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? So imagine yeah. how that happens. You yeah. have to. Over time, yeah. And you have to communicate that. You know, you have to have those talks like, like I know when Scott's in the middle of, selling a bunch of houses or real estate or whatever mm -hmm. he's like super stressed you know he's a little snippy yeah and i tend to get like that when i'm busy especially when i'm producing something i get really snippy sure you know, it's because i'm used to being in charge and running shit yeah you know so you know I'm, i got 30 40 people hitting me asking me questions all the time you know because i'm the one making it smooth so i get home I'm like babe can you grab that thing he's like no uh -uh. <laughs> you know what i mean i'm like oh shit i forgot <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> i'm so used to having you know people do shit like that yeah. that i forget that you have to turn it off so yeah. it's the same thing you have to remember to but luckily i have somebody who's in my life who's like you were not on the set right now mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. so you know what i mean i need no you cook yeah. <laughs> you're the one who cooks. Guess, <laughs> the other side of that is you can also take that moment to go i'm gonna do something nice for scott and mm -hmm. you get up and you go just bring the, what can i get for you i'm you know those kind of things right. i, I want to totally change gears and i want to ask you uh, so she and i watch a lot of bbc type okay things, love you know, those yeah exactly right. the acting is i'm gonna say this i think the acting in general is at a higher grade oh 100 percent. okay good yeah. i'm totally. a layman when it comes yeah. to this stuff why do you think they're all getting all our roles yeah you know what i mean now, now a lot of american actors would disagree with that yeah but i think there's something to it to an extent yeah and i was trying to put my finger on it because i can't quite do it but we watched the um, the Durrells and Corfu. I don't know if you watched that, but mm. it's just this wonderful story. And we watched another one um, called Broadchurch. Oh, I like, love Broadchurch. So the acting in that show, right. top to bottom, mm. character for character, is right. just excellent. I mean, the writing excellent. is solid, but I think right. the acting, there's a moment where... And it's it, just a small little town. It's small just simple. Little town. Yeah. Nothing really big happens, but... But it's all like suspense. Yeah, you know it's connected. I mean? Right. And I enjoyed Longmire, but I kind of put them in the same thing where that, all that bad shit shouldn't right. happen in Longmire. But instead of Longmire doing what they did in Broadchurch, mm -hmm. they kept ramping it up and ramping right. it up, and it got more ridiculous. Right. And I still enjoyed it, but they started to lose me as like, they, like we are in northwestern Wyoming. Right. Like, there's just way too much murder and mayhem going on <laughs> up here. Whereas Broadchurch would have one murder. One murder. But a lot the entire of, season. Yeah. Should, right? yeah. And a lot of intrigue around right. that. Like, right. oh, you're banging that. You know, and, right. and so, but there was a moment in I think the first season when the, when the family loses the boy and everything. That mm -hmm. doesn't ruin it for anybody. But they're all sitting on the couch and there's a big reveal mm -hmm. and there's like five of them on the couch. And it's mm -hmm. like the Simpsons picture. You know, right, they're all right. sitting there and all five of them. Right? Yeah. All five of them portrayed an emotion, but it was like 
this emo- like each one fired different emotions, like three different emotions, and you could see it. Whichever one you looked at, right. all in an instant, and right. they didn't all show the same thing. Yes, there was shock, and maybe right. they each showed shock, but at a different moment. Right. And I was just like, God damn! I wanted, I wanted, I wanted it back. And I'm like, did I see that? Mm. And I did. It wasn't mm. just someone talking. You could see just very subtle facial acting. Right. And right. I was like, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know we have the capability of doing that, but do we just not demand that from our TV shows? I or? think, I think that, and I'm, I have never done a BBC show. I have a show that I want to do that's a BBC show that takes place, you know, in London and all that mm-hmm. shit. Um, <clears throat> but. My understanding, and I'm, I actually have somebody I could talk to about this, um, Tom Robert Smith. He's the one who did the, um, the um, Gian Versace mm-hmm. one. Yeah. And I interviewed him for the Writers Guild podcast. I'm supposed to interview him on my show, too. My understanding is a lot of those actors come from theater because mm-hmm. that's what's big there. They may or may not have more rehearsal time than we do. I don't know. Because, you know, the government usually pays for a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So they probably have more time. In, in American um, cinema and, and television, you're shooting things in six to 10 days, sometimes maybe 14 on a really big show, but you're just moving so fast. You just don't have the, the, uh, uh, the time or the real estate, you know, to really, you have to depend on the actors being at that level, yeah. you know, um, um, and the directors don't have a lot of time to really spend with you talking about a moment or, you know, this is what's going on. They're just, they're shooting and, you know, they're just moving. It's a machine. Yeah. You know, they're just moving and they're just hoping the actors get this moment. They have a little talk and then they action, you know what I mean? They block it. They organize it. They figure out what's what. And then they, they, they do it three or four times and they move on. Yeah. You know, there's a few shows that, do 20 takes but very rarely very you know rarely, if it's a lynch yeah. maybe the rest of them are like you know the producers are looking at you and dude no you got one more that's it you're spending my money you know, yeah. yeah you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. so i think there's more at stake probably and ours are a lot more expensive they do even though broad church has think done two or three seasons mm-hmm. it's pretty rare for the british shows to do that long yeah you know um so I think there's a lot of different reasons. I'm sure I'm not giving you the correct things, but these are just my off the top. Yeah. Well, you I, know, I can see that the practice thing probably The, the rehearsal is important. Yeah. And then also, you're right, they're not bound to a, uh, hey, this is a hit serial. Right. Let's just keep this thing cranking for 12 seasons and make right. make other ones, you know, right. CSI this, CSI right. that. Not, and not to knock that form, mm-hmm. it certainly works, but... There are sacrifices in both areas. You know? But see, even, even with shows like that, there's a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You can get caught up in a procedural world. You can work on those shows and make a ton of money because they're, they're, they're a huge machine, money-making machine. Yeah. You, know, you, you can work your way up as a producer on those shows and never have to work again. You know, just because so many residuals and they show it all the time and you know, it's network, you know, it's prime time. You know, it's all the top things. Where you lose yourself if you're working on a show like those, and I love those shows. My husband's my favorite. My husband's favorite shows. But where you can lose yourself is it doesn't go character deep. You know the structure is the same every time. You always know if you watch NCIS this or NOLA. If you watch NCIS LA and you know, whatever the fuck it is, you can see by Act Three it's going to be a big shootout. You know what I mean? It's yeah, always yeah. LL Cool J and what's his <laughs> name. You know, should you know they're going to survive? It's yeah. the same formula every single time. Right, but that whole South and Midwest is their audience, you know, and that's the biggest part of our, you know, we live here in California. This is one of the biggest states and with yeah. the biggest, but those other places are killing us with numbers and all the other stuff. So that's, that's their money. That's why they can spin off and be in Miami and be in New York and be in <laughs> you know, yeah. LA. And it's funny, like, and this is not in any way to mock ice tea because I have tremendous respect for mm-hmm. him. But I think he's a good example of that. He's on Law and Order SVU, and he gets a line every every show. Mm-hmm. And quite often, it's this like, "Oh yeah, I know a guy named Cracker Jack. I'll talk to him." And then that's it. That's mm-hmm. his line when they all powwow. And then he goes out, and maybe he gets another little scene where he goes and talks to Cracker Jack. Right. But that's it. Right. And then he's not a main part because it's not his show. He's mm-hmm. a he's a an additional player. Yeah, but he probably gets five hundred grand a week. For oh, that. for sure. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm like, yeah. And I, again, I think it's fantastic. Right. But it's just it, it's funny how you can be so anybody could do what he does, 
and accomplish the mission of saying the lines. Right. But you got to believe it. And I don't know that I necessarily believe it when Ice Cube does it or mm-hmm. Ice-T does it, but um, he does do it well. You but know? he's a personality. Yeah. And you've bought into the personality now. And so, and you have to remember that this, this town is full of loyalty. And this town, even though that's in New York, yeah. you know, the guys are still here even though they're in New York. Right. So um, the, the, the guy who created that show and runs the show, I've heard him talk about Ice-T about this. The only reason why I'm talking about yeah. this. And he talked about how Ice-T was the first, like, music celebrity, I believe, that I'm, pre- um, I'm paraphrasing all this, um, that he worked with that didn't like show up with an entourage. He doesn't, he's not all fancy on the set. He just shows that he's got his little car. Yeah. You know, he shows up, he's by himself, yeah. you know, since day one, you know, and he knows his lines. He's always off book, you know, and he's like, why would I fire him? Yeah. You know what I mean? He's easy <laughs> yeah. to work with. Everybody loves him. Yeah. You know, he shows up on time. He mm-hmm. leaves. He's back on time. He's not drunk when he gets there. He's like, why would I fire him? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, so you, it's all about loyalty. You know what I mean? So, so if you have those things and those elements in your show, why would you ever need to let them go? But as you watch, all the other leads have left and, you know, spinned around. He stays the same, yeah. you know? So why would he ever leave the show? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He can make 500 grand a week. I'm spitballing, yeah, right. you know, but and, it's, it's and, and, have, near and have eight to 10 lines a week and yeah. never have to work again. Right. <laughs> you or just I mean? do whatever other things he wants. You and know, exactly. like, let me go do this work. Right. Get this done. This takes me this much time. And the rest right. of the year, I can go tour with my heavy metal band right. that he has. Right. And, and not worry about it. Yeah. It's a good position to well, be but in. Where I was going with the British thing, I don't mean to interrupt you, was, was one of the things that happened. So say you become a writer on one of those procedural shows. Yes, you make a fortune. But now you come back to Hollywood and you're like, hey, I'd love to write on Better Call Saul. And they're like, yeah. mm, you're the procedural guy. Because they don't. Honestly, a lot of writers don't have a lot of respect for those shows because there's so, like I, every time I sit and watch my husband watch it five times in the show, I, I'll say the line with them. And he looked at me like, how did you know? I was like, Come on. that was the biggest cliched line. I saw it coming a mile away. Whereas other shows, you're like, wow, look how he twisted that around. Mm-hmm. Look how smart that was. Look how clever that it's like they don't have to take the time to not be on the nose yeah they have to make it clear like well we found that you know pete turner was yeah. was lying on the ground at such and such a set time <laughs> well where did you see pete turner oh i saw pete turner what nobody fucking talks like that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean so but they can get away with that shit on a yeah. real show you know they would kill you for that they would it's just like uh whenever i see spy stuff and they do a, a bona fides right. they're like you know the hawk flies on wednesday no one says that shit <laughs> a bona fides says nothing you would if you do it right uh-huh. only you and i know so I'll, I'll come up and i'll see you at the starbucks and i'll say hey i'll, I'll take an americano with cream ah uh, you know what no cream mm-hmm. and you'll go okay that's like the first part of it oh i see where you're totally going totally right. normal and then right. you kick it back across to me to the counter and you were the reason why we talked to you it's code the, it's code and you'll mm-hmm. say oh no no you know like why don't you let me do it how i do it and mm-hmm. i'll throw the cream in like this mm-hmm. and then i'll say yeah, okay, great. So that means the meeting's on or the bona fides is established. Okay, right. But it's never some like, let me get to the tall <laughs> horn. Like, that's yeah. stupid. Because right, if someone right. over the whole point is if someone over here is they don't know, you know? But, right. in a, but in, see, but see, that's why, and you have to remember that because you are a part of that world. You understand what everything is. When you are an executive, you're going, how can the audience know this? Right. You know? Unless yeah. we're showing at the same time that such and such just came from doing whatever with the hawk, right. we're not going to know that they're talking in code that that's about whatever. Right, yeah. But, you know, if somebody sets up that, oh, I'll go to my guy at the coffee shop, he'll know what to do. Yeah. Wink, wink. Uh-huh. Then we'll know what you see. You have to plant. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. You have to yeah, plant you, all that information. The procedural. Yeah. Right. I always laughed at, like, the, the formulaic nature of all these shows, especially when you've seen as much TV as we all did growing up. Like uh, chips, every mm-hmm. every episode starts off on the freeway and there's a huge accident and the same <laughs> stunt all the time. You know, right. it may be like five different stunts, but they wrote the, a car is going to flip over right. possibly. You know, right. and then the guy's going to get away, right. and then an accident they catch him, and then there's a lesson, and then they do the epilogue, cool like 
John and Ponch on jet skis or whatever, right, right, you know, right, right. with the slap action. Or like my favorite show when I was a kid, you know, one of my favorite shows in the in the 80s was Dukes of Hazard. you know? Yeah. And same thing. How many yeah. times can Roscoe Pico and them chase them? <laughs> yeah. <and laughs> you crash. know what I mean? He's going to crash. every yeah. week, yeah. there's some chase, and all of a sudden, and some, for some reason, yeah. some weird guys in suits show up in their freaking area, uh-huh. and they have to <laughs> sit. Why would they come to that little yeah. town? You know what I mean? But, yeah. you know, it's it's formula. You and, know? and the same thing with all, like, the sitcoms. You know, at some point, you've seen all the jokes. Right. And so I can't watch. I know Big Bang Theory is a big hit. Mm-hmm. I can't watch it. Because right. I'm almost like, it's just dumb. Like, right. It's just the same. You know, it's like, I've seen every episode of Cheers. I've seen every episode right. of The Simpsons. Right. Seinfeld. Um, Mr. But Feldy. I can watch Seinfeld over and over. It doesn't bother me. There's I cl- still laugh. There's a cleverness, though, in a Seinfeld right. that didn't exist before right. that. You know, it was really unique. Yeah, I yeah. can watch Sanford and Son. I can watch All in the Family. Like, all those old shows, I can watch over and over. They yeah. don't bother me. Lucy. I yeah. still see Lucy's I have never seen. I'm like, when did I not see that show? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a trip. It's a trip. <sighs> Lucy. Yeah. Man, that's way back. I watched The Aviator last the night. Aviator. Oh, the that's, movie. Yeah, yeah, the right. movie. Yeah, Leonardo the, DiCaprio is that one? Yeah, yeah. And right. he does a Howard Hughes. And it's mm-hmm. just incredible. Like that, that, And a lot of that stuff happened right here in this on um, this hunk of land right okay. here. Because we're actually on the lot. But, um, you know, making those movies back then and how uh, similar. It's, but Olivia de Havilland is still alive. She's over 100 years old. Really? And she's one of the, like, she's from that era. Mm-hmm. And she's still around. So it's neat to see that, uh, especially sitting here at the lot now that I'm thinking about it. Mm-hmm. All of those story things that have come along. Have we gotten better at movie craft, do you think? Oh, God, yeah. I think, I mean, some people would disagree, you know, but I think more, it's probably more technical stuff because we're shooting on digital and not necessarily on film. I mean, some people still do, you know, mm-hmm. the Tarantinos, the Lynches, and, you know, some of those other people prefer to still shoot on film. I, I think it's probably more technical. I, th- I think we're a lot more savvy about the style and the way we write. Yeah. I think it's a little more clever. It's not on the nose. It's a little more staccato. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's got all those things. But, you know, you still can't not watch The Godfather and see just how genius, you know, from, from the way the camera's sitting there to mm-hmm. the acting to, you know, to the dialogue itself. You know, you still have movies that if you're going to be a filmmaker or a writer, you have to watch, you have to read the script to see what it looks like to yeah. get your to get your ideas. And that's why I was telling you, even when you're, if you're going to write a script in a certain genre, you know, study the other ones that worked. You know, why, why did uh, Apocalypse Now work? Why did Full Metal Jacket work? Why did, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, any, any of those, those scripts. And even, even in the last... 10 years, you know, the ones that have been nominated for Oscars, those scripts are available. You just go online and go. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's really neat to see how simple and sparse those things are right. and then what comes out, you know, because right. sometimes be like, ah, the writer just tells the bag of meat to smile and mm-hmm. it's not really like that. No. You know, there's really a lot no, more no. going on. Uh, I, I read The Rock and that okay. gave me an idea for how to take one of the stories that I had, the one I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. and how to kind of frame it. You know, because there are some great stories in that. Ed Harris is awesome. That's that a movie. great script. Too. Yeah. The no, actions it, are fucking it, off the chain. It was, yeah. It, it, I was it in was, The Rock. Were you really? But I never got shot. Yeah. Oh, man. You remember Anthony Clark? He played the hairdresser, the uh-huh. flamboyant. I was in the scene with him. Oh, yeah? And we got up. We went upstairs <laughs> to to shoot that scene with John Connery, and I met all of them. Uh-huh. And we started to do the scene, and Anthony started improv it. Uh-huh. And the director was like, wait a minute. Like, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> he just kind of let him go, and I yeah. ended up being pulled out of the scene. Oh, I never man. even got to. I mean, I can't hang with Anthony. Anthony is a fucking beast. Yeah. You know? Uh, so I ended up going. They ended up sending me downstairs for like three or four days, and they never shot me. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, it's fine. Anthony yeah. was amazing in the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I was still wanting to be an actor, I'd probably be upset, but yeah. no, I'm not upset. Well, that movie came out the way it needed to. Right. Yeah, it was, that was I got movie. paid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't get any residuals did you see it, but new, I got paid. Uh, did you see the new Mission Impossible? Not yet. No. That movie is incredible. I hear it's amazing, though. It's really, really good. And, you know, yes, Tom does all his own stunts. All his other stuff aside, his ability to be mm-hmm. that person, that thing. At his age. At his age. Right. All of the skills. And one of the stuntmen that John and I know is mm-hmm. like, you don't want to mess with Tom Cruise. Whatever mm-hmm. it is that you think you're good at, right. he can do better than you can already. I it. I and if not, it. you can give him two hours. and He'll, be <laughs> he'll figure it out. Yeah, because he's just got... That it, like, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, so and so doesn't deserve. He deserves to be where he's at. Mm-hmm. He has put everything mm-hmm. into it. And part of I think what makes him kooky is what also makes him great at that. Because right. he, can, I can't go get locked in a room for 
20 hours and come out like mm-hmm. that much better. I, I, I Is that what he did in the movie? You no, know, but you know, like when he like learned how to sword fight. He oh, right. went out and just for three months, right. hours and hours and hours every day. I don't have that kind of dedication. You want to think, but you, you do. would if you were getting that type of money. You Maybe. knew you knew your shirt was going to be off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's all these different. Like I talked to like a couple of my friends are you know celebrities and their bodies are just ridiculous. They call it camera ready. Uh-huh. So you want to have your body camera ready all the time. Right. So you might. So that's why you'll see like you and I both love like UFC and yeah. you know fighting and boxing and shit. Sure. And you see the guys when they're fighting, their bodies are ridiculous. But when they're off. You know, like, remember Ricky Hatton? He would put on 80 fucking pounds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? And have to lose it all back again yeah. because he didn't, he wasn't camera ready. You know what I mean? He was enjoying, oh, shit, I'm a millionaire. Yeah. I'm going to go out and just drink at the pub every night instead right. of, I might have to fight in three months. Right. You yes. feel me? He was like, oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll lose it again. But that ended up being bad for him. You know what I mean? Whereas people who are shooting movies know, I got six movies lined up after this. You know, I have to take my shirt off in all of them. Uh, so I got to keep my body right for whatever. So yeah. they stay camera ready at all times. I think, I do think, though, that when you get to the elite level, though, there's things that have separated you from your peers, mm-hmm. you know, where you can hold your I mean, he holds that movie. Right. And there's a lot of people that couldn't take the stunts out. I mean, Ving Rhames isn't working hard anymore, right. you know, because yeah. he's had to slow down for whatever reason. Yeah. Tom Cruise, he's a marvel. You know, what totally. He and let me tell you something cool about Tom. There are a lot of there are a lot of things that happen on the set that a lot of people don't know. They only see what they see on movies. The rumors I've heard about Tom is number one, he's the nicest guy to work with. Yeah. Right? And the most giving. Yeah. So what I mean is, for example, say we're on the set, say we're shooting a scene, say you're Tom and I'm me. Okay. And we're doing a close up on me. So that means the camera's facing me and Tom is off screen, I'm looking at him, right? So I'm saying my monologue or whatever it is to Tom. Well, a lot of big stars, this isn't true with every star. Mm-hmm. A lot of them, though, will bring in like their, their, their double or whoever, sure. their, you know, to their stand in to do their lines for that. Yeah. Like they don't have time for that. But what they fail to realize is they miss the momentum of the fact that you're looking at me a certain way. You're giving me, a, you may not say shit, but it's about how I'm responding to you. It might be a look that makes me react a certain way or give something back to you, right? Tom is known for being the guy who's standing there. Yeah. As big as he is, it could be a little tiny little moment that they have on me. He stands in his fucking position. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and that tells you a lot about him because he knows his name is on the marquee. Everybody should be like that. If he could do it, damn it, everybody, everybody could do can. it. Yeah, Jay Moore tells a great story and you've had Jay in your show. Right, he does the thing where he directs him. Yeah. Yeah, that's a true story. And, and, and so there they are doing the same thing right. face-to-face doing a shot and Tom is so good at the face-to-face mm-hmm. part he's like, by the way, let me direct you. Right. He, yeah. Okay. Right. That's incredible that right. he's that present to mm-hmm. be to be several layers out mm-hmm. from what's going on around And he's just pointing like, get the fuck over there. I yeah. can't see you. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Right. No, it's, it's brilliant. It's fan- and, then, and Jay doesn't even like, oh, shit. I see right. what you're doing now. Right. But he's able to hold it together. It's fantastic. And, and you get the same thing from really good writers when like a lot of writers will get on a TV show and they'll be offended by the fact that the showrunner or the head writers had to rewrite them. Mm-hmm. And they might have rewritten a ton. But what you... What you should be smart about doing is going back and looking at the script going, oh, wow, now I see how he changed it. I thought my line was funnier, but theirs had more character. Yeah. I thought my line was whatever, but oh, the, I see what it is. I the voice of the character was much more the way that they see it. You know what I mean? If you could separate yourself with that, and where I'm going with that is the same way that Tom Cruise can direct you is the same way your, your showrunner on your show would and should be able to do too. Because right. they're the ones who wrote the script usually, you know, anyway. So they know those characters as much as you've been inside of it for months working on it, too. You'll never know it the way they do. You know what I mean? And that that is something that that a lot of younger writers don't understand when they get on a show. They all of a sudden realize, oh, shit, I'm being I'm being re-. they take it personally. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, I was rewritten instead of going, oh, I see why I was rewritten. Now I'm going to really study his voice. So the next time I write my script or write this outline, I'm going to fucking nail it. Oh, I see where he's going. And that's what I do. I'll just sit in here in my office and study the, the outlines the way that they wrote it. I'll look at how they describe something. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, it's in this tone. Oh, I see what they're yeah. doing here. And 
even even here's another example I'm talking about. You know, I always do. When I submitted my script, I was sent the script to my show, Deadly Class, right? And I went, oh, well, the script that I'm going to submit, I'm going to take it and make it look like their script. Hmm. So they formatted it a certain way. They they bolded their exterior, you know, yeah. uh, scene headings. They underlined this. They sure. did, so anytime I came to those things in my script, mm-hmm. I made it look like they did it. You know what I mean? I didn't totally. have that initially. Yeah. But so when they opened it up, it felt like they were reading their own script. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so they know yeah. I can do that voice. You yeah. See? Krista Vernoff <clears throat> did that with Shonda Rhimes, right. learned how to do her thing. And mm-hmm. I, I did the same thing, you know, with Intel reports. Right. I want to know what the commander needs to see. Right. They hate blue. They're not going to believe any blue in that report. Right. They want a, the bottom line of bluff, the bottom line up front to be the very top thing on the report, you know, so yeah, you definitely have to learn the voice of the people you're writing for. And, and the cool thing is like you as an example, and this is the reason why I want you to just keep reading more scripts is it's not about just reading them for the sake of reading them. It's about reading them and going, Oh, I love Mm -hmm. how such and such guy wrote, you know, whatever script you're reading. Yeah. What if in my story, I wrote it in that voice. That's okay to do. That's taking homage. And going on, the way he described, oh, by page three, he introduced the character this way. The mm-hmm. first time he saw the character, we knew exactly who that character was because he immediately defended that kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we know he's the type of person who puts himself on the line, you know, for whatever. It's like little things that you do. The more you read them, you go, oh, by page 30, which is my act one, he did such and such. Oh, so I need to make sure in my script that my hero does this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You start to see those things. You can watch TV and movies all day long, but if you're not reading them, you're not seeing what they did. And that's what I'm telling every people. I was like, oh, well, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm like, just fucking read. You'd be yeah. amazed how much more power you have. The reason why I always tell people that I feel like personally, this isn't me being arrogant, why I feel like I'm dangerous because I have so many scripts in my head that I can pull from that you can't figure me out. You know what I mean? And I can give you so many cool ways of, of, of prose or describing something or making an action pop because I've, I've read hundreds and thousands of these things. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That, that you just can't touch me. Right. You know? So you got to make yourself that, that available, that dangerous yourself because you're competing against people who know how to do that better than you. Yeah. So how do you get better than that is to learn from the best. So just pull from the best. You shouldn't let a week go by you haven't read a script. Not one week, you know, because you're competing against people who read seven. You know what I mean? And that's real. And that's yeah. what I'm always telling everybody. You, whether you're writing a book, if you might be writing a book, you're, write, you, you're going against somebody who spends four, five, six hours a day writing. Yeah. And you have 10 minutes. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. So how do you get that good? That's, that's that 10,000 hour thing, you know? And last thing I'd say, you know, you were talking about Tom Cruise. He has his 10,000 hours, 10 fucking, you know, 20 years ago. Right. 25, 30 years ago. Yes. He had his 10,000 hours. So it's easy for him to just steer you where he wants you to go. You know, it's like getting on a motorcycle for him or riding a bike. Yeah. You know, it's simple because his muscle has adjusted to that. That's some game for you.